I'm super excited to welcome John Bad here uh, today. Um, he is from the Albert Einstein School of Medicine. And today we will be discussing brain cell replacement as the cornerstone to beating aging. Um, so it's uh, quite the mouthful, I think. Also, uh, fun fact, we are currently considering Joan Baird's uh, project for our Health Extension Accelerator later this year. And I'm telling you this uh, in case, A, uh, you could be interested in mentoring or uh, in, in supporting this project in any way, but also B, in case you think that your project could potentially benefit from mentorship in this group, uh, please apply to the Accelerator. And I'm gonna share the link here. Uh, I will share um, John's bio in the chat, and with that, without further ado, John Bert, welcome. Thank you so much for joining. I'm terribly excited for your presentations. He's going to present for about 25 minutes or so, and then we'll uh, do questions. So please uh, feel free to collect them already in the chat. All right, let's go. Great. Uh, thanks for having me, Allison, and for introducing me. Uh, it's wonderful to have this opportunity to share what we've been working on. Uh, let's see now if I can share my screen. I have a few, they're all very simple slides, um, I hope. Um, and uh, related to the work we're doing with the rather bold title, Brain Tissue Replacement as the Cornerstone to Beating Aging. And um, I'm putting this forth as a, an idea for discussion. I'm gonna try to convince you that that's the case. Uh, whether or not you agree with me in the end, it would be great to uh, discuss why or why not? Um, let's start maybe with something that, let's see, I put it in uh, screen mode, okay? Um, you can see my slides, right? Okay, let's, uh, let's start with something that I think we all agree on and that's, you know, we wanna achieve health and, and the longer we can be healthy and, and live long, the better. Uh, I think we all agree that diseases get in the way of this uh, and the greatest cause of diseases and mortality is aging. Uh, and also aging even on its own. So if you're lucky enough to be disease free and make it to 100 years, uh, you're still gonna be uh, quite frail and um, you, know, you might be considered healthy for a 100 year old, but if you compare yourself to a 20 or 30 year old, you're not gonna be quite so healthy in any way. So I think where there's a lot more room for discussion and ideas is how are we going to beat aging? And this is where I'm gonna to try to, um, I can't advance anymore. Uh-oh, that's bad. Let me try to see if I can restart this. Um, that's never happened to me before. And it's funny because it also doesn't happen in the in the test runs. <laughs> yeah. Okay, perfect. We're on the slide again. Yeah, we're on the slide, but it won't move forward. So let me just try maybe, I can't even escape the slide. I've lost all control, I guess. Um, okay, let me stop. Does there. the right arrow at the bottom of the screen advance it? Uh, I'll try that, but I can't. Well, I think while we're waiting, um, and uh, Jean Bert, you just interrupt me ah, when. Um, yes, Great. it works. Okay, good. Thank you, whoever that okay. was. Okay. <laughs> um, so, where there's more room for discussion and, and ideas, I think, is how we're going to defeat aging. And this is not a new idea tissue replacement. By tissue replacement, I mean cells, tissues, organs, replacements are. Uh, have conceptually been around as an idea to be aging for a long time, but I wanna try to convince you that you know the time is right. Uh, and also if tissue replacement's ever gonna be useful, uh, we need to figure out how to replace the brain as well. Uh, not as a whole organ, but you'll see it, it uh, should be doable. Okay, so the first thing I I want to start with is a question, what is aging? And that might seem like a, uh, a rather simple question and forgive me because uh, to a group like you, uh, it, it, you know, what is aging? I think we would all think we know what aging is, but I think it's worth bringing up because we often talk about the effects of aging like diseases or you know, how different intracellular pathways or different functions are affected in aging. And I would think of those more as the effects of aging rather than aging itself. Um, and so 
biologically speaking, at its core, what aging is, and this has also been known for a very long time, is the accumulation of damage to all our classes of macromolecules. So DNA, carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and this damage is very complex. So if we look just at proteins themselves, as one example of the macromolecules that are affected by aging, there's many different forms of damage that have been documented uh, to occur, you know, glycation, depurination, oxidation, and the list goes on. This is just a partial example. And the same is true for DNA, carbohydrates, and lipids, very complex forms of damage. And we've heard about, it pre, you know, recently uh, in this forum, how this damage affects different intracellular pathways, many pathways, and how to understand, you know, how aging is affecting cells, uh, there's a lot more basic research that's needed to identify pathways that we have yet to identify that are affected by aging, and also how we might uh, try to reset some of these pathways to function normally uh, using car combinations of, of drugs or, or pharmacological agents. Um, but I think we need to acknowledge the limitations of that approach to tackling the effects of aging. Uh, one is that finding combinations of drugs that will reset these pathways, uh, many of which are you know, life-sustaining pathways in delicate balance with each other, uh, without causing more side effects than, than benefits, I think, for me at least, is hard to imagine, given that we have trouble often finding a, a drug for a simple ailment that doesn't have side effects. And also, you know, all it takes is one essential pathway uh, to be malfunctioning to get um, effects such as accelerated aging, uh, like you see in Hutchison-Guilford or in Werner syndrome. And, you know, okay, so maybe my imagination is limited. Maybe we can actually uh, come up with these drugs. But even then, we're, we won't be tackling the cause of aging itself, which is the accumulation of damage. And if we don't do that, then you know we might be health, we might be able to live a little longer and healthier, uh, but we won't be able to defeat aging. So, oh, okay. So to um, defeat aging, uh, and I think what we need is uh, a replacement approach. Right. I think this is mandated by the complexity of the damage. Uh, okay. So let's talk about replacements a little bit. So, you know, the human body uh, replacements per se, uh, in terms of implementation, are not problematic. So every part of the human body has been surgically replaced uh, over the last few decades. Uh, and I mean every part of the body. I, I was surprised to find out, you know, the face, skull, um, you know, arms, of course, every internal organ, um, every part of the body, sexual organs have been replaced. Uh, so surgically, the implementation is not necessarily problematic. I mean, no one likes surgery, but it's doable. Uh, the problem is, though, that many of those replacements have come from deceased donors. And, and, um, and in some cases, um, you know, uh, artificial limbs and organs or hearts even. So what we need uh, to get replacement to work as a general strategy is uh, better lab-grown organs, right? So those have been in development for a while. Uh, we heard uh, Sonia Aronson in, in the first meeting raise the very important question of what's happened to, to these uh, organs. And, and the answer is, well, they're still in development. They're getting better and better, but progress is frustratingly slow. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with a lack of investment in developing these organs. These organs are only um, developed to treat specific diseases right now, uh, not, to, not for aging. A and the investments that go into that are, are rather limited. Um, but eventually we'll be able to replace all the different parts of the body, uh, except of course the brain as a whole organ. So, uh, you know, uh, if we can replace every part of the body, but we can't replace the brain, that will leave us, um, uh, you know, in, in 
having achieved replacement for the rest of the body uh, uh, it will be all for naught if your brain is still you know, degenerating and you're becoming senile and you can't remember anything. So the brain needs to be addressed as well. And obviously it can't be replaced as a whole organ, um, but it should be replaceable based on what we know and the evidence to date uh, at a cellular or small tissue level level if we do it progressively over time. And I'll go into that in more detail because that's, that's more what my group focuses on. And we should be able to replace the brain progressively without losing who we are as individuals, right? That's important. Uh, and so the first reason why uh, brain cell or tissue replacement makes sense uh, is that um, if we think of the brain or the human brain, which was the photo on the first slide I showed you, uh, it's mainly neocortex, right? That's the outer part of the brain that's all folded. That's what defines us as a species. I mean, other mammals have neocortexes as well, but ours is disproportionately large compared to the rest of our body. It also defines us each as individuals. That's where our mem long-term memories are stored, uh, our thought patterns, our self-identity. But so the neocortex is extremely plastic by nature. And we've known this for a long time from studies in, in model animals. Um, but my favorite example to illustrate um, how, just how plastic the human neocortex is, uh, is um, this one. So in this case, what's happened to patients over the course of several years is that their language center has completely moved to a new substrate without a disruption in their ability to speak. And, and they didn't notice any difference and the people closest to them didn't notice any difference. So what happened in these patients is they have these slow growing benign gliomas. I hope you can see my cursor here. This is glioma right in the language center. And over the course of eight years, it's growing without being diagnosed and no one can tell it's there. And then eventually the patient has a really bad headache or even a seizure, they go to the hospital. Oh, you know, bad news, you have a brain tumor, good news, it's operable. They take it out with surrounding tissue for good measure. And in most cases, the patients can still speak perfectly well. And these are not young, you know, like infant patients, these are, uh, adults of advanced ages, 50s, 60s. And during that time, their language has moved to a new part of their neocortex, right? This doesn't happen when you get a stroke in the same area. That's a catastrophic event and there's no time for plasticity to take place. So the idea that uh, this has this transfer of function to a new substrate has to occur progressively over time, right? That's an important concept. Um, but in any case, it does suggest that, um, re that replacing or providing young, naive tissue should allow us to regenerate, uh, rejuvenate uh, the neocortex in the brain if we do it progressively over time. So the other uh, reason why uh, brain cell replacements or tissue make sense is more recent evidence over the course of you know, five uh, or 10 years at most, where many labs have been putting in immature precursor cells for the neocortex in the adult neocortex and showing that these immature precursors differentiate into neurons that make the appropriate connections to distant parts of the brain in model animals, uh, so not in humans. Although there is one example, although not in the neocortex in humans, uh, in, the, in the ventral telencephalon that also supports the idea that young uh, neurons in the adult can still find their way to appropriate targets. And I just gave one example here. It's kind of my favorite uh, from Faulkner et al. Uh, in Munich, but there's been many examples from a dozen labs uh, independently finding the same thing. And I'll show you a little bit of data from our lab as well. Uh, although uh, I'm not showing at all, of course. Um, so, the, so the general idea then in doing progressive replacement of the neocortex would be as follows. So 
here you'll recognize a, a cross section through the human brain. Uh, and this outer layer here is the neocortex blown up so you can see a little better here. And keep in mind, this very simplified cartoon, uh, this is, is more of a conceptual cartoon, but in practice could be how we would execute progressive brain cell, brain tissue replacement. Uh, so first of all, the aging brain loses uh, a lot of volume, creating space to put in new tissue. So assuming we could make neocortical tissue, we could uh, transplant it, graft it in the neocortex. So we already, lots of labs are already grafting tissue. It's just not very functional yet. But the idea is we would make it functional before grafting it. Uh, then we could silence to get, eventually get rid of the old tissue that's there. We could silence, whoops, sorry, uh, um, neighboring uh, parts of the neocortex, uh, like the uh, slow growing glioma did. Of course, we would not use glioma as a means of silencing an area of the neocortex. Uh, we could do it pharmacologically. There's a lot of choice of drugs that the details would have to be worked out, of course. And then we could remove that once it's silenced and not used anymore and the functions have moved to new locations, in particular, this naive substrate that's uh, uh, you know, ready to, to encode any new function, then we can remove the, the old brain tissue and uh, progressively uh, uh, regenerate the neocortex in that way. So I'll just show you a couple of data slides from my lab now. So this is what we've been working out in mice. We're using the adult mouse neocortex as a platform for rebuilding functional human neocortical tissue. Here's one of our graphs. So here's a lesion. We just make these canonical lesions in which we can insert uh, cells that we have in scaffold. Uh, and these cells, uh, when they include neuronal precursors, differentiate and send projections to normal targets along normal pathways, such as the corpus callosum and targeting uh, down to the striatum. Um, so we have, um, we have a paper that's in bioarchives, which describes this in a little more detail, if you're interested. Uh, when we include uh, vascular cells in these graphs, which is important to maintain the health and, and viability and function of these graphs, we find that these vascular cells form blood vessels. They fuse with the host vasculature. Here, the graft vessels are labeled with GFP in green. They fuse with the graft vessels. And we could measure uh, blood circulation within, the, within them in live animals that have grafts using two photon microscopy. So you can see little green dots moving by really fast. Those are red blood cells that we've labeled uh, with dye O, which is just a fluorescent dye. Right. So, so that's really good. It sounds good, right? But there's still a lot that needs to be done before these, this grafted tissue is functional. Uh, one thing that's missing is a lot of cell types. So what we've done so far is graft excitatory uh, projection neurons. Those are the principal neurons of the neocortex with vascular endothelial cells. And we see that they both integrate very well, but they can't possibly function normally if they don't have these other cell types as well. So we wanna start including those cell types in our grafts and we know how to generate all these cell types from human embryonic stem cells. Uh, the protocols are improving. They're not always perfect with 100% yield, but they are getting uh, much better. And they're certainly good enough uh, to, to start testing in our, in our models. So the, our first aim from my lab is, is to assemble these neocortical, uh, all the cell types that we need to make a, a complete cortex shown here. Uh, in our graphs. And it's not just putting them all in there. They have to be organized uh, correctly as well. There's a certain cytoarchitecture that is needed for the proper connectivity of the neurons in the cortex shown here. So you can see the different layers have different uh, neuronal densities with different neural identities or subtypes. So we're using a scaffold, we're developing a scaffold to be able to do this. And so far we've shown that our scaffold supports the survival differentiation and integration of both the neurons and the vascular cells, whether they're human or mouse cells. 
Um, so, so that's a good start. Uh, is we still need to optimize it. There's still some issues with it. And equally important and something that we want to do in parallel is, is to do, show a proof of principle that uh, neocortical tissue replacement can work. Right? And the way we're doing that is, uh, this is just an outline of the experiment. Uh, but we train an animal to do a particular task that requires you know, multiple parts of the neocortex, but the information is eventually processed to control just you know, the right uh, four limb digit, for example. And so that all the information that's processed has to go through there, that part of the neocortex. It's a small part of the motor cortex. Uh, and so what we do, what we want to do is lesion that part of the neocortex, put in our graph, uh, and then confirm that the uh, deficit uh, in the ability to do, do the task is there, which uh, is not a problem. Uh, and then in this graph, we also have these uh, floating electrodes that we're testing out uh, that can monitor the activity of the precursor cells to tell us when the, the graph has differentiated to the point where its neurons are becoming active. At that point, we reinitiate behavioral training. Uh, and once the animal gets good enough to perform the task again, we can silence specifically our grafted neurons because we've infected them with a particular um, channel that we can silence the neurons with to show that the animal can no longer perform the task and requires the function of those neurons to perform that task, right? And so uh, this is transient. So this is a drug activated channel. Once that drug washes out, then the animal should be able to perform the ta task again. And we can redo this several times, right? And that would be the first uh, demonstration that neocortical replacement is possible. Right, because we will have replaced a piece of neocortex with new tissue that has taken on the loss function uh, and, and provides a useful behavior to the animal. This has not been shown yet, so I think it's an important landmark uh, experiment. People have put in a lot of cells into the adult brain and shown that they have benefits, uh, but those are from bystander effects. So it's just the fact that the cells secrete good factors and keep surrounding cells happier. But no one has, sh has shown functional replacement of the neocortex yet. And so that's why this aim, I think, uh, is one that is very important for us to do sooner rather than later to generate a lot of interest and investment in this approach. OK, so I think, oh yeah, just a couple of slides on this. This is just what our floating electrodes look like. Uh, you know, there's a, a, a solid platform that is uh, attached to the skull and it has these small electrodes that are inserted in our graph. Uh, this is what it looks like in reality, uh, you can see here. Uh, so we've been preparing to do the actual experiment by, by getting all our tools ready, our electrodes. Uh, and, and here's just the people who um, are, we've been collaborating with at, at some level. Uh, but again, you know, it's, part time by somebody in their lab contributing to this project. And what we really need to accelerate this moving forward is to have dedicated people, uh, people that are 100% dedicated to this project from these different groups that specialize in, in the different aspects of this project, which we need in order to make uh, functional uh, neocortex. So I don't know if I've convinced you or not, whether uh, in combination with replacements for other parts of the body, uh, replacement of the brain, particularly the neocortex, we can talk about the rest of the brain as well, uh, but uh, particularly the neocortex, uh, it, it can be the cornerstone uh, to beating aging. Uh, so I don't know how much time I took, I can't see. All right. Fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> Lovely. Uh, you're great on time. Um, okay, okay. And uh, I think I finished quite uh, actionable. <laughs> uh, you're getting a lot of thumbs up, I think. Um, so, okay, I, we already have a few uh, comments from in the chat. Um, and perhaps, um, Christine, when you start with your question, 
uh, say maybe a word or two just about your background so Jean has, a, has some context for your question. Thank you. Um, I'm Christine. I'm the founder of Florica Therapeutics. We're working on um, making hypothalamus stem cells from humans. Um, I think the work you're doing is absolutely amazing, and this is the way of the future. Um, do you think it's possible to engineer these cells that you're making so that they become refractory, like resistant to all the inflammation and all the causes of aging that, um, you know, to, uh, you, you can't really change the microenvironment, but maybe by engineering the cells, and this touches on some of the comments some of the other people have said, um, maybe by engineering the cells, you can uh, make the cells refractory to the environment. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, because these cells, right, as you know, uh, are, are grown in culture, you can modify them any way you want, right? And if we had the knowledge to make them better in any way before grafting them, uh, we certainly can. Uh, and I, I assume we certainly would, um, you know, but yeah. Thank you. Thanks. And good luck with the hypothalamus. That's, of course, uh, another essential part of the brain. Thank you. Um, next one up, we have Marty. Oh, you're muted. Sorry, I'm Marty Edelstein. I do, I'm uh, one of the co-founders of Covalent and we develop uh, one molecule thick uh, materials to use for water purification and renal replacement devices uh, as part of a larger system. Uh, and my uh, question, if I can find it again, uh, was um, do your um, constructs um, attract blood vessels uh, as they're coming in ischemically initially? Yeah, no, that's a very good question. So um, our, in our scaffold, we put uh, VEGF, uh, we put ANG1 to encourage vascularization. And, you know, we were worried, at first we were doing these graphs in sort of pristine neocortical tissue. And we thought, well, you know, what happens if we do it in damaged tissue? Is it gonna be uh, less able to vascularize, to incorporate? And we were pleasantly surprised to find it was the opposite. So our, our first paper uh, that's at, in BioArchive uh, shows that, that uh, we use stroke as a model in that case, which would also be our first uh, clinical case study for this approach would be stroke, not aging. Um, but in those mice, we find that vascularization is greatly improved uh, by grafting into an ischemic environment. Um, and, and we still get nice differentiation and projection and connections of our neurons. That's really consistent. That's really consistent. Sorry, yeah. go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. That's really consistent with old work we had done I, I, when I was in college, actually, on revascular revascularizing uh, ischemic uh, baby rat kidneys, um, and it actually worked on human neonates. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah, this was ages ago at Mass General um, Pediatric Surgery Department. Yeah, did you know, did you ever figure out why? Like, what were the factors that promoted that? And the... No, no, we, we implanted pedicles uh, into ischemic kidneys and then uh, sacked the rats um, and looked at barium sulfate perfusion to see where it was uh, actually, how the revascularization was going over time. And you get complete revascularization, so you could do a, a, a nephrectomy okay. um, on the other kidney, and then cut off the original blood supply uh, to the original ki to the kidney that was left, and kidney would function totally hundred percent. Yeah, so there may be something about uh, damage and inflammation that activates. Uh, yeah, there's obviously signals going out. Yeah. Thank you. All right, lovely. Um, I'm reading out Keith's question. Keith is asking, Jean, is there any reason to believe that if a patient has advanced Alzheimer's, for example, will newly grafted tissue serve to remediate such systems condition or will the newly grafted tissue quickly become similarly corrupted 
due to, due to the surrounding environment. He's not expecting a definite answer, of course, just curious if there's reason for, uh, for optimism. Yeah, so yeah, so exactly like Allison said, I think there is reason for optimism. We don't know. Um, the reason, so there's a couple of points uh, that might address that. One is we already have a lot of data uh, for um, Parkinson's, right? So, but that's a different part of the brain. That's uh, the basal ganglia. Uh, and so, you know, the, the graphs of, of stem cells or fetal um, midbrain tissue were transplanted decades ago. And in postmortem tissue, uh, they found that it takes, you know, at least 15 years, but the cells are still there. The grafted cells are still there after uh, two decades. But uh, at up till 15 years, they, the grafted neurons don't show the deterioration that the host neurons have shown. So over time, yeah, they, they start showing it, but you know, you're already getting uh, 15 years there um, of, of renewed function. There are problems with those other problems with those graphs um, that people are addressing. And, and there's several clinical trials now that are starting again uh, for grafting in that part of the brain. Uh, so the same thing might be true uh, for Alzheimer's. But the other thing to keep in mind too that addresses this point is is this inherent nature of the neocortex for plasticity. It is competing. Uh, our neocortex is uh, always sort of in competition. So whatever we need it for, whatever function we need it for, that's the function that wins out. So in, so in Alzheimer's, it's accelerated degeneration. It might be a little, uh, you know, it, plasticity is challenged a little more than it would in an elderly person who is highly functional. Right? But even in those highly functional elderly people, if you look by MRI at how they're using their neocortex for routine tasks, they use wider and wider areas of the neocortex to perform these tasks. And that's why they're able to appear to be you know, high functioning. But that's very different than a young adult brain where the functions are much more compartmentalized and efficiently used. Right? So, so that tells us that you know, this level of plasticity and the competitive nature of the neocortex, if you put a tabula rasa uh, structure in there, it will get used, right? Uh, you know, whether it will, or how quickly or not, it will succumb to whatever is causing Alzheimer's in the disease brain, um, you know, we'll have to see. Um, but I guess, but I, I think there is reason to be optimistic that it will be, uh, effective for a while and you know and if you can include what Christine was saying you know if by then you have some idea of what was causing uh, Alzheimer's you can uh, address that uh, so that it's not happening in these graphs as well. So I, I think it's important to follow up with the pessimistic case here too though um, I, it seems very naive to blindly assume that you'll get however many decades that you would get from you know, cells as, as if they started the pathology of Alzheimer's or, or whatever, um, without, you know, we, we know that there's crosstalk between the different kinds of damage and the signal, you know, both signaling and other types of crosstalk. So for example, the misfolded proteins that build up in various diseases, especially the neurodegenerative diseases, have a prion-like virility to them. So simply putting in new tissue, you know, new, new tissue the misfolded proteins are likely to simply act, you know, spread around to the new tissue. And this, the rate of that spread is probably, you know, at least as fast as the rate of the new training. You know, as you said, it takes, you know, years and years for the slow, you know, change, uh, the shift in um, functionality to go from one part of the brain to the new tissue. Um, so this seems like a great and important component of an anti-aging strategy that comes in, you know, a one-two punch with actually getting rid of and clearing the existing damage. But I would be very, I wouldn't be too optimistic about this working by itself without actually fixing the underlying damage in addition. 
it's sort of like the, you know, the way people have, have talked about reprogramming and other kind of stem cell approaches to replace the tissue. This looks, looks great, but I think, I think you're going to need, you know, uh, it depends on which theory of Alzheimer's you use, but, you know, for example, to the extent to which it's CSF drainage that's being impaired, replacing tissue with grafts isn't going to solve that problem. And I, and I, and I, the pathological cascade seems to be such that once that gets very, very far along, then even brand new neurons and things would get affected very quickly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you bring up several important points there um, and, and maybe working backwards. So one of them, yeah, right. If it's a CSF problem, uh, then, you know, just replacing neurons is not going to uh, solve the problem. So of course, uh, for, you know, if we want to address aging or maybe even Alzheimer's because Alzheimer's if you ask 10 different people what Alzheimer's is, you get 10 different answers, right? Uh, so, um, you know, you, you don't only want to replace the neurons or even that tissue in the neocortex, uh, but you'd also want to replace, you know, the, the, the vascular plexus of the, uh, the PIA as well as the choroid plexus. You know, so the other parts of the brain's, brain would also have to be addressed. Uh, in a true rejuvenate, you know, in a final rejuvenation uh, strategy. So uh, yeah, I, I, I agree with that. As far as like the aggregates, you know, I for for the Alzheimer aggregates, uh, you know, I don't know that the experiments ever really been done um, because you know the model systems are not great and we can't do this in humans to say how much those either intracellular or extracellular uh, aggregates. Uh, move or recede other areas, right? So I, I don't know, maybe that could be a problem, but it's definitely something, you know, one of the first things that would need to be looked at uh, in doing uh, early clinical studies. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Lovely. Next one up, we have Joe. Ah, yeah. So I'm, remain, I remain super excited about what you're working on. Uh, thank you for working on it. Um, I also read your book the other day. Um, Thank you. It's great. Um, and uh, bought a few copies for other folks as well. Um, I'm wondering, um, it's obviously kind of a long, you'll take one? Okay. Um, it's obviously kind of a long term project. Um, like it's, it doesn't feel like, oh, you just make a company out of this um, and to start delivering therapies to people. and in a short number of years, like there's a bunch of science to be done. So it feels like, you know, like, like a, like a little, like an institute or something like that. Um, or like, like, I like your, 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 your impulse to get people working on it full time. Um, and like, so for that, you kind of want to get people out of their existing academic labs and into one focused environment where they can all like drive. Um, that would be ideal you know, dr kind of dr drive the project in a focused way altogether, um, to clear out all the roadblocks and make everything go fast. Um, some kind of institute like thing. And I'm just thinking about how, like how to fund that, who's going to fund it. And um, um, the, thing that, the same question. <laughs> yeah. So the, but <clears throat> the thing that, that came to mind would be if, if you could define a clear sort of like like motivating goal, like an overarching milestone of some kind. Um, like we're gonna bring these people together. We're gonna, it's gonna take, you know, 12 scientists working for five years. And at the end of it, um, we're gonna, we're going to achieve X. You define X in some way. Like we have, um, you know, the entire neocortex of a mouse is replaced and the mouse can then like, run around, do a maze, mate and have babies or whatever, like whatever your like Turing test for brain replacement is, um, that, that could be, that could be motivating. Um, yeah, so I, I, we do have a development plan. I'm willing to share it with anybody who's interested, I guess, <laughs> uh, with milestones and yeah, it's a, sort of a, you know, five, within five years, what we think we can accomplish, uh, given uh, the, you know, a group of people that, that are working on this. How much would that cost? 
Yeah, we've adjusted the the anticipated costs anywhere from ten to fifty million. Ten to five zero or ten to one five. Uh, ten million to five zero million. Got it. Okay, somewhere in that range. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. okay. Yeah. Thanks. And you have such a milestone plan written out. Maybe you want to share it with me so I can share it with the group afterwards. Okay. Um, okay, and we have uh, Larry next. Um, Lawrence, are you here? Maybe you find it hard to unmute. I found the unmute button. I couldn't find yeah. a, the share <laughs> button, but for some reason, I don't know why, you know, but the raise my hand button. Um, yeah, I'm John, I'm sure you've, you've heard this before. I work with the FDA and, um, you know, you know, you know, why don't you try spinal regeneration where the function is known and, and things like that first um, to see, but the, the plasticity of the spine doesn't seem to be that great in the spinal cord. And so what you're betting on here is that there's a lot of plasticity in the neocortex, which there could be. I mean, and I, I was just wondering how much you've done study of like tumors where they've taken out, where they know they've destroyed areas of functionality. I mean, you showed one there, but, you know, there's been a lot of mapping of the brain areas and things like that where you know you 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 know you show where things are localized and where things recover and things like that and you know why you know i even see you know good and consistent you know there's a lot of brain surgery a lot of tumor removal and there's a lot of recovery from some of this stuff like you said people lose their speech they regain it you know things like that and even from strokes and stuff like that and how, how much remapping have you been and the reason why you're focusing on the cortex is because the evidence of plasticity why things like the spinal cord don't seem to have a lot of plasticity. I mean, they, they, there's been a lot of efforts to regenerate spinal cords and, um, you know, they, they get somewhere close with a mouse. They can kind of limp a little bit or something. And then they, um, you know, by glycans programming or they think glycans are involved in the cells sort of getting in the right place. But, you know, is, is that, is that why you think the approach is, is has some chance of doing something or, or is there no plasticity that doesn't matter? Oh, no, I mean, plasticity is an integral part of it. Um, and, and yeah, so, I mean, we're not, I'm not a neurosurgeon. We're working with neurosurgeons that uh, do implants uh, in humans as one of our collaborators. Um, but my, what, one of my favorite neurosurgeons is uh, this guy, uh, Dufour in, in Paris, who does a lot of these uh, brain surgeries to resect tumors and, and other brain surgeries. Uh, but to some extent, they all do this, right? So it's open brain uh, awake uh, surgery. And so, you know, they do a lot of mapping with uh, uh, electrodes just to see, you know, where functions are. Uh, initially, you know, they always did this to avoid uh, hitting important areas uh, with, their, with their scalpel. But, um, but in this case, they were doing it to see where things have moved. And they even had a patients with recurrent tumors where they went back in and remapped and showed that in fact, you know, language had moved again to a different place uh, after a new tumor had grown over the course of years. Uh, so this is done, a lot, a lot of this is done extensively and also by functional MRI, of course. Um, so what, what would be the purpose of it then if, if you already had this plasticity there? To, to do this, I mean, adding something that's, you know, where the capability is already there, what's the purpose of it if it's not to, re, you know, you, you know, can you show that you actually recover functionality that was destroyed before? And it doesn't seem to be coming back. I mean, the main purpose again is to, uh, you know, in stroke, of course, it would be to give the opportunity of the person to more easily relearn whatever function was lost. But for aging, it's, it's to get rid of the, the brain, the, the neocortex, that you know, but you're, that you're starts that starts going downhill, even at a. a but a you're young. you're going to replace with fetal tissue, or what? What kind of tissue are you going to generate to really well, replace yeah, so, this stuff? So this is the tissue that we're engineering with all the cell types, as well as the correct cytoarchitecture. architecture. Um, we could do it with fetal, and in fact, we, we do have a couple of experiments where we're testing using uh, human fetal neocortical tissue in grafts. Um, but that's, you know, 
and that might work, but it's not a, a very scalable uh, approach yeah. or applicable approach. Uh, so these are going to be cell lines that you're going to you're going to you're going to you you have a group of cell lines, so glial cell lines, you have neural cell lines, you have macrophage or dent dent yeah. We start with we start with human embryonic stem cells. Okay, so you start with that, yeah. And, and once we get to patients, oh, so I mean, if if the actual scale is, uh, you know, like if you go back to Jess's example, I think it was it was better than mine, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, if you go back one slide. Um, I think this is a different meeting. <laughs> I muted him. You go ahead, John. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so we can get all the cells from human embryonic stem cells. And once we get to the clinics and doing this with patients, uh, we can do the same with induced pluripotent stem cells. Right? So we don't have to worry about uh, rejection. Okay, so you have human embryonic stem cell lines and you see differentiation that gives you something like a neocortical tissue then is, is what, what you're seeing, John. Well, yeah, so we have to reassemble the cells because the protocols right now, are you, you get sort of purified uh, single cell types. Uh, so yeah, so you generate the single Yeah, because stem cells, we have a difficult time defining what they are. I mean, you know, what are all the markers needed to call it a stem cell? I mean, stem cells are really differ, difficult for us. You know, mesenchymal, you got, you know, the, you got the, 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 you know, the blood stem cells, the neural stem cells are, you know, I mean, it's always difficult to know what markers really make it a stem cell and things like that. And then when they're, and how to get functionality back. Yeah, I mean, but we have a much more functional definition of the stem cells we use. They give, they generate the cell types that we want. Like we, we, okay. we're, not, we're not looking to, you know, characterize the, the stem cells. But in a matrix, like, because you have glial cells around nerve cells, you have, you know, things like that. It's not a simple, a simple thing. No, I mean, the, a lot of these precursors self-organize, uh, but, but the principal neurons do not. Uh, and so those are the ones that we have to pay attention, not just to uh, the cell types and their differentiation stage and, and the ratio and everything, but also their position in the graph. Okay. No, no, I think it's an interesting thing to look at, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Next one up, we have Vadim. Yeah, hi. Um, yeah, I, I work at Brigham Women's Hospital, Harvard Medical School. I'm just an academic researcher. Um, so this is a super interesting uh, project, actually. Um, uh, my question is, because we study aging, how, how do you think this would affect uh, grafting the cells would affect the biological age of the rest of the tissue of the brain? Because uh, I guess this project has many similarities to like parabiosis or bone marrow transplantation from young to old. And, uh, you know, there's always a question that, um, yes, you fix a particular problem uh, and, and, and maybe you rejuvenate a subset of the tissue, but then this young tissue would interact with the old tissue and, and the crafting procedure itself might age the rest of the brain. So I, I wonder if you, you know, consider this kind of really looking at, at other parts of the brain and seeing maybe if there is a rejuvenation, but at the same time accelerated aging of, of the rest of the tissue or not, at least to exclude that possibility. Yeah, yeah, no, those are very important points, right? The, the rest of the brain or even the rest of the neocortex and how old tissue and young tissue are gonna interact. So, you know, what I didn't include here and it's part of a, a longer term plan is, is to address the other parts of the brain. That's why I'm very excited to hear Christine working on, you know, hypothalamus re replacements uh, because we need these replacements, not, not just the neocortex. Replacing the neocortex is not going to fix the other parts of the brain, right? It's still going to be old. I don't think it'll accelerate the other aging of the other parts of the brain, but it's certainly uh, unlikely to greatly uh, affect or, or rejuvenate them. Uh, so, you know, the different parts of the brain have to be addressed. And, and the way this would be done, uh, foreseeably, is by uh, doing, uh, you know, functional replacement. So auditory cortex with auditory thalamus, you know, with other auditory parts of the brain at once, sort of unilaterally and the other side. So they develop together, uh, young and uh, young 
parts of, of, of the brain. Uh, and then, uh, you know, both subcortical and cortical parts would be on. Um, so that that better mimics how they develop normally. Right? So they, they, you know, there's this handshake phenomenon where thalamic neurons are going up to the cortex, cortical neurons are coming down and they, you know, they contact each other. They, they connect better. Maybe, but maybe I meant might just simply like apply the epigenetic clock or some other kind of clocks, you know, to, to these tissues. Just to simply test what's going on. Oh yeah, yeah. No, I mean, yeah. Well, I mean, I think that'll be a very important thing thing to look at in our model organisms is uh, how the graft, a young graft, affects the old brain, and how the old brain affects the young graft. Yeah, and for that, we can look at all different markers. Um, so, for, senescent cells would be good to look at too. Obviously, they're going to be yeah, proliferating so, due to the graft procedure itself, for example. Yeah, senescent cells, epigenetics, protein aggregates, like you mentioned before, Carl. Uh, all these things would be very important to look at. Thank you. Uh, I had Creon with a comment and then Brian. Hi, thanks, Allison. Um, okay, so I'm wondering if you are at all familiar with the work of Ellen Heber Katz uh, in Philadelphia and um, who for quite a number of years now has been inducing regeneration in mammalian organ systems without um, grafts, but merely by manipulating uh, the metabolic environment. Um, well, first with knockout gene variants, but then by just with uh, drugs. Um, and I believe they've made progress not only in the heart and bone and skin uh, but even in the CNS, I'm not sure about the brain. I know they've made progress in the in spinal cord regeneration, again, without grafts. Um, any knowledge of that? Any interest in that? Happy to follow up later, or if you already know, maybe you have a comment. Yeah, no, I'd be, I'd be happy to follow up, uh, but just maybe a quick question. So what do you mean by regeneration? So there's a, a damage that's induced, and then they apply uh, these, these drugs or manipulations to better promote uh, regeneration, is that? Here's what they've seemed to have figured out. And this is my uh, you know, approximate understanding having been her friend for quite some time. And she came to Foresight and, and presented at least on one occasion, which Allison put a link to in the chat. Uh, and you might wanna see it because it's pretty cool. No, but they did things like um, cryoprobing and damaging the heart of a mouse that first had this knockout and the heart essentially fully regen. They do LD50 cryo damage to the heart. And then the mice that were damaged grow back with hearts that are histologically undiscernible from the healthy hearts of the control mice. They also then figured out, they did this with other systems, bones, jaws, you know, full mammal organ systems, pretty much. So they, what they've determined is that the that the regeneration capabilities that we tend to think exist mostly in like amphibians and stuff like that are actually latent in mammals, but they're turned off. And so they can be turned back on at least under certain circumstances to a certain level of <clears throat> efficacy. Like it's not perfect, but it's damn good. And so maybe you can turn it on in the brain to do some of these things that you're doing with grafts. It kind of causes, from what I understand, by manipulating certain metabolic factors, which they first did with gene knockouts, and then later on they figured out just how to do it with drugs, they can set a metabolic environment for the cells that uh, sort of promotes, instead of promotes scarring, it promotes de-differentiation and then re-differentiation to regrow an organ system like an amphibian does when you cut off its leg or something like that. Right, right. No, I mean, that, that's also an area I think has promise uh, because it's it, it's very similar in a way, you know, you you you're removing damaged tissue or good tissue if you're just doing a test, uh, and then getting new tissue there, right? So it it sort of uh, should replace all forms of age-related damage uh, in doing so, uh, except maybe DNA mutations, uh, unless they're selected against in the growth uh, phase of that organ. Um, so I think, yeah, there's potential there too. And I, I'll, I'll look it up. I, I look forward to reading more about that. Yeah, look at that thing that, that Allison posted in the chat. 
I'll yeah. just on that yeah. link because oh. that's pretty reasonable. I'll make sure to connect you to afterwards. Another, right. another, another thing I just want to mention here, and, and I'll stop, is that this might be, this just occurred to me recently, maybe this is an example of this, of this sort of, of a combination of sort of Dave Sinclair's methylation stuff and the uh, antagonistic pleiotropy. And what I mean by that is that it might be that for mammals, you know, evolution decided that it's not worth having this regeneration capability. That energy and effort is better spent on other genes. And so mammals just methylated this, switched this stuff off somehow. I don't know if it's methylation. We switched it off. We didn't delete it from our genome. We just switched it off. And maybe it pays now to switch it back on. Yeah. Thanks All right. Thank you. Thank you, Kriyan. And we're now one minute uh, before time and I'm gonna take Brian's question. I just wanna make sure I've asked you this before in the last meeting, but I'm going to launch a poll for those who have to hop off at, right at the hour. We're going to stay on for uh, his question if John Albert can, but uh, I just want to know uh, what your privacy preferences are for the group. And um, there's uh, a lot of different varieties. We can either uh, not record as a default. We can record only the presentation and have our afterward discussion private and or we can record and publish as default, but I always follow up with the speakers anyways to see if they're comfortable with it just to make sure that, uh, and that, that I get your answers here before those who have to go have to go. But uh, without further ado, I'll give it uh, to Brian for his question. Thanks. Thanks, Hudson. Um, Jean, thank you for the great and really important work. I would, I would love to have my brain replaced with its 25-year-old variant. Actually, an improvement on my own by the 25-year-old version. Um, I was wondering, thinking about Nir's question in, in the chat about the disruptive, complicated nature of the surgery. Um, the, the really invasive nature of it and damaging potentially. I'm wondering whether there might be, I'm sure you've thought of this and have ruled it out for some reason, but a way to, and you, I think you touched on this at Undoing Aging a couple of years back um, and noting the difference in the surface to volume um, ratio for mice and humans, um, which makes this a lot harder in humans. But is there some way to introduce individual cells with and, and use some sort of chemotaxis to get them to go where they should go um, without actually use having to silence large parts of the brain and replace that with some sort of sort of large amount of formed tissue? Or is that is that not? Is that just simply going to be too hard to get enough cells to get to where they need to go and to differentiate and take on the role they need to take on structurally? Yeah, no, it's funny you should ask that. Yeah. Um, so we have two projects in the lab. One is the one I presented to you today, and another one is uh, exactly that so, sort of using uh, cells that can disperse uh, throughout the brain. and. And, and getting them to convert to another cell type like the principal neurons of the neocortex. Um, so, you know, we're very interested in that for a lot of reasons. It could be used for not, you know, for, for many, many purposes. Um, but it won't get rid of the damage that's there, right? So that's why I favor this replacement approach uh, for rejuvenation. Yeah. But then my, so my other question that I posed in the chat would be if, um, I mean, I can see that a lot of functions and memory is in a way a function um, are distributed and can be slowly moved, not quickly. So you don't have a stroke, but you slowly silence something. But it seems as though there's, there would be a risk that silencing large parts of the brain would actually result in a loss of me, of memory to some degree. And that, that, that's, why, that's why that makes me a little bit nervous. I mean, there are parts of me I'd love to lose, as, as Carl pointed out. There are memories we probably would like to be rid of, but, yeah. but I'd like to choose the ones that I get rid of. Yeah. I mean, we have, we have a good idea where functions lie in the, in the neocortex now and, and how quickly they move. Uh, but, you know, that, that would need to be uh, adjusted, you know, I don't know, according to taste or what, but you know, obviously you don't want to silence too much at once. You right. Know, it, it, it's going to be a balance. You know, you're like, okay, well, you want, 
and the silencing also, you don't necessarily lose that. It's being moved, right? So you provide new tissue before you start silencing. But right. still, you know, I would feel a little uneasy about silencing my whole prefrontal cortex at once. You know, I have a lot right. of great tissue there waiting to take on that function. I, right. I would do it in a more cautious, stepwise manner. Yeah. But All right. Yeah, that's it. Thank a, you. Um, hi, John, I just want to make sure that, um, given that this is recorded uh, and it will be published, so it will be available to others who are not in this group, is there anything that you want people to know how they can advance your work? You already mentioned that there's potentially like a technical milestone roadmap, but what would be most useful for people to know uh, to help you with your work? Yeah, so, I mean, we're, we're ready to uh, accelerate this. We have all the key players uh, in place. Uh, that are willing to recruit experts in all these subdomains that we need for the different cell types, for the, uh, for the bio scaffold, uh, for the surgeries, for the physiology. Um, you know, all, all our collaborators are ready. We just need uh, the funds to hire the people and get this thing going uh, at a rate that, you know, can give us all some hope for <laughs> rejuvenated brains. At the rate we're going now, we're not going to get there for us around today. So yeah, so that's what it comes down to. Okay, well, I'm hoping that you share information, and I will put it in the show notes. Um, yeah. Also, the you know the format in which this research can be carried out, uh, whether it's academia or as someone pointed out, an institute just devoted to this, that would be ideal. Uh, or, you know, hybrids between industry, academia, that's, those are all possible. And we've thought about, you know, those different mechanisms, uh, but really to get anything started, we need the funds. Yeah. yeah, very nice. I love Joe's suggestion with uh, different milestones that, that you'd actually have. Um, okay, well, thank you very much. I'm hoping uh, that you share with me information if people want to follow up with you and I'll put them in the YouTube show notes. So if you see this video on YouTube, they should be in the notes. Okay, well, uh, is there anything else you want to tell the group? Otherwise, I'll be closing uh, the meeting. Yep. Okay, well, I already got a lot of thank yous in the chat. Um, and yeah, I think people really thoroughly enjoyed this. Um, fantastic work, very, very ambitious. And um, we're hoping I'll be in touch with you and then in touch with the group. And yeah, I am very, very much looking forward to everything closer this year. Thank you, John. <laughs> Bye, everyone. See you soon.